<laughs> Hello and welcome to an introduction to blood, sweat, tears, and a lot of money. Uh, basically some lessons of naval history, broadly speaking. Take six, possibly seven. We're going to call it six. The other one only, uh, one of them only got to 30 seconds. I am Dr. Alex Clark. Please, though, call me Alex Clark because, Doctor, I look behind for my sister. The whole reason I started using Doctor on my Twitter handle was because. I got fed up with, even when I was younger, before I had my own PhD, and it took me a lot of work to do it, so I'm kind of proud of it, but even before I had that, my sister has a PhD in civil engineering, in geotechnics, and the amount of times people would, when looking for Dr. Clark, would come up to me rather than her. She's my older sister. And mentally, though, annoyingly enough, she still does look younger than me. And she's older than me by a, a chunk, but, you know, looks younger than me. I can live with her. I'm prettier. <laughs> but it annoyed me. And then I saw the same thing happening on Twitter, where people were really quite condescending. To some of the uh, some of the academics, some of the historians, when they put up their the fact they got their title, and I could be understanding putting on their title, they were proud of it. I'm proud of it. It takes a lot of effort to get it. A hundred thousand word PhD thesis in my case, plus three years of writing and researching, and a year of getting of organizing Viva, doing a few minor corrections, which included visiting. Uh, archive which I hadn't visited because I hadn't had the money during the uh, during the actual PhD and graduation ceremony so four years overall but only three years actually doing the work a year doing stuff <sighs> most of that year actually I think about six months of that year was waiting for graduation ceremony um, but no it was it was worth it I got my PhD for me it was worth it but, no. So that's why I have my PhD up there. Not because everyone needs to call it me, but because I was doing an experiment to see whether I would get the same reaction as my female colleagues did by putting my PhD up. Shock horror, I really didn't. Honestly. Just got a load of congratulations. It was nice, but you know. I've been having a little bit of pushback. We had so much fun. Uh, Victoria Taylor, especially. I don't think she's got her PhD yet. She's just having that fun already as a PhD student. She specializes in the Luftwaffe. And the amount of people who tried to tell her what the Luftwaffe was and wasn't up to it's quite funny to watch. Anyway, to today's fun history, and hopefully I will get all three parts of this done and published before six o'clock this afternoon. But we never know, because it is now 2.04, and I'm just recording, hopefully going to record, part one. Oh. Basically some lessons from naval history. It could be. It could be worse. But it could be, uh, you know, th some of these lessons get forgotten far too easily. And I've got a whole range of books, but also, I have to admit, this is again, like for our projects, the lessons aren't going to stop here. I'm going to bring up other examples at future dates, because... I've gone with the ones I can put together quickly and effectively in the time I have available while still checking references and things for the book and making sure everything in the book is perfect because it's got to be 
enjoyable and easy enough to read that everyone who's not an academic who's swallowed about 20 of dictionaries can still understand everything I'm saying and enjoy it and follow it, but also has to be referenced to a level at which academics will find it useful, because that's the balance I'm trying to strike. Some say it's an impossible balance, but I don't think so. I really don't. And I don't have a sponsor, as you know. I only have my lovely patrons, but and they are wonderful. But I have noticed that others do sort of get sponsors, and I, yes, I haven't. I did. I have seen some interesting things for that. And so today, I ended up because the only shower gel we had using Lynx Africa. So if I suddenly roar at any point, you know why. Roar. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I saw someone doing that the other day, and I just thought it was funny. So even without a sponsor, and <laughs> God help me, I'd never be sponsored by Lynx Africa, or probably actually by Lynx Africa. It was just what was left in the shelf. Um, yeah. Oh, I just wanted to see doing that. It was funny, especially as you know that was all available today. And then I did Madagascar. I'd recorded that all yesterday, and then I want today. It's Lynx Africa, and really, Lynx Africa would have been so much more appropriate to have on the day I was recording in Madagascar. But you know, so naval diplomacy and conflict management. Naval forces are scalable force and scalable presence. I, you can quickly and easily adjust them organically yourself. No one ha else has to be involved as long as you have a fleet auxiliary and can sustain them in where your ships are in the world off other people's coasts. You can deploy as many or as few as you like. You can deploy what you like as long as it can get there. And no one can say anything. So you can reassure allies and you can tell opponents, mm-hmm, without having to ask or involve anyone else. Now, often a balance of local relatively, uh, relative weakness off-balanced by overall relative strength. Um, that's an actual phrase. <laughs> and I would always prefer to put it in counterbalanced or overbalanced by overall relative strength. But I can understand why they've used the phrase off balance. Um, basically, the thing is, it's like you have one of those old measuring scales, right? And it's got three joints on it, three balancing planes on it, and it's balanced on a pivot about here. So your enemy is here. You have a teeny tiny weight here, and a mahusive weight over here, and that balances it in your favour. But because this is the teeny weight here, so close to them, they feel still strong, so they don't feel like they are negotiating from position of weakness, even though they are. That's how naval diplomacy works. Um, but it's also... It's about being present. It's about being there. You know, The worst thing you can do in terms of naval diplomacy is withdraw a ship. HMS Endurance, 1982. Worst thing you can do is withdraw a ship. You maintain presence. So, Britain now has a forward-based ship. Permanently in the Gulf. Basically, that Britain signed up for it forever now. We've already tried the redrawing from Suez, uh, from east of Suez once. It uh, didn't work out well. You now know what the first, next, the first response is going to be. First one. But. We're now back. The question is, how much are we going to commit further afield? And if we are going to commit, 
what sources are going to be, resources are going to be put because they do need resources. Forward basing is not a magic key or a magic carpet. That's much what you all might wish it to be. Singtao. Now, in the nicest way, I could talk about this all day, and I probably am going to. So, there's a reason I've picked it up. It's my first one. A, there is a great article on global maritime history about this subject. I know, because I wrote it. B, it's one of those incidents which I'm surprised more people do not take notice of. And C, it's really quite cool and involves... A Royal Navy light cruiser, town class, called HMS Birmingham, staring down the barrels of multiple, at least three, um, Ashigara class heavy cruisers of the IJN in Singtao Harbour. Over a merchant ship. It was interesting as an event. The command structure, the various people involved, were interesting. What you have is a classic scenario. In the Pacific, the Japanese are definitely stronger than the China Station Squadron. And as such, they have to be handled with respect. And usually, this involves a lot of diplomacy, a lot of visits. A lot of making nice but also a lot of calculations. Classic example is Admiral Noble is invited to a very senior Japanese Admiral's funeral. Admiral Noble at the time is the uh, China Station Commander. And he says, yes, I will come. Da -da 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 -da. He specifically brings the squadron which he's brought with him for the funeral as part of the honor funeral the first harbor they make land is, uh, they make landfall is the opposite side of japan from where they're expecting the japanese were expecting them to meet uh, come into one side like others were going to be doing meet up with a japanese squadron and then sail round the royal navy got themselves round Perfectly. Arriving and then the morning they look out and go, oh, good God, there are three Royal Navy cruisers there. And Admiral Noble goes, yes, I arrived today as I promised. Before you were going, oh, there must have been a bit of a mix up. Please, let me use this time to hang a few to dinner. Yes, you're bigger than us, but we're very well trained and we are painted a beautiful shade of white. We make the Great White Fleet look like it's beige. That's also something which is being forgotten about naval diplomacy. Actually painting your ships white. Again, it's all been lost in the Cold War where the obsession, where the obsession, or well, the understandable obsession, was on war fighting, which you can get, but in a nicest way, peacetime presence missions, fighting peace requires something slightly different. That's why I like HMS Dragon having a dragon painted on it. That's why I like all sorts of different things. When they are do being used for presence, they need to be a presence. A very easy way to make your ship slightly have a much bigger impact is to paint it white, as a cruise liner will tell you. Although that's possibly a good reason not to paint it white these days with cruise liners. So maybe a nice blue. Or a blue, white, and red. Although I think the crew might be annoyed with me for painting requirements. You now know the next one as well. I'm taking my time with these. I'm going to. So. Basically what happens with this one is the SS Vincent the Paul is a merchant ship. It's a small merchant ship and to this day... Its ownership is murky. And uh, it probably was owned by some of the major shipping lines. 
but we'll never be quite sure. Because what it seems to do is go to the places which Japan and China are technically having a war, or the kind of peace where both sides are readily sharpening rocks, let alone buying more guns. Um, do some trading and then turn up in the more respectable oral ports and the stuff gets transferred to the uh, ships which go back around the world. So, uh, you know. Maybe not quite owned, but certainly definitely a present. Seriously, it's been Grand Central Station as far as the phone calls have been concerned today. That accounted for one, two, and three. Now, so the SMS pool is taken by the Japanese. Turns out legally, but the British don't care about this at the time, and that will be sorted out later. In the British rules, what they should have done is made a complaint to the British, and then it would have been inducted into prize court in Shanghai or Hong Kong or wherever else the British have a prize court, Admiralty prize court going on, which would have looked into it and have assessed and made a decision. The Japanese didn't. The Japanese were going to be taken on. Now, the trouble with being the big, powerful nation. The trouble is with being world power. Is you're either a world power or you're not a world power. And if you're a world power, then you do not let, especially if you're one of the preeminent world powers, if not the preeminent world power of the period, remember this is 1939, and it's, we're talking about naval power. The Royal Navy cannot let this happen. They cannot, because if they do, that is a bigger problem than anything else. Because the moment you start conceding is the moment you are now acknowledging you are weak. And the moment you acknowledge you weak, you're weak, you really are weak. Whereas if you always act like you're strong and you're capable and you're there and present, it doesn't matter if you show up in a light cruiser, as they do, to face down three heavy cruisers and take back your merchant ship with it only being backed up by a tiny little sloop. It do that doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter what you show up in. They know what's back home. They know what's in the Mediterranean fleet. They know what's in the home fleet. And they know if they cross that light cruiser... If they try and beat up that light cruiser, and by gum is it a big light cruiser with a lot of six-inch guns and a lot of torpedoes at close range with all those guns pointing on its way out when they're pointing guns at it, pointing those guns at all our bridges and our land-based headquarters. It's not just a light cruiser. When you're talking about presence, when these ships are doing it, yes, you might see a sloop in front of you. You might see a light cruiser in front of you. It might be a frigate in front of you. But what it represents is what matters. It's what it stands there and goes behind me as a whole fleet. Which is exactly what Mr. Pitt, the younger, certainly was interested in. Pitt the Younger was obsessed with mobilising the fleet. I mean, seriously. He's 24 years old and he's Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He makes every... Nicest way. Any person who comes on the stage whenever I'm looking at television and they go, oh, this is the young person of politics. He's going to achieve or she's going to achieve so much. And I sit there and go, how old are they? 26, 28, 30, something. And I go, nope. 24 years old and Prime Minister of arguably the most powerful nation in the world at the time. In 1787, the Dutch anti-Orangist patriots seized power. Um, they deposed the House of Orange and there was all sorts of issues going on. They were very nasty to the Prussian princess, who was the... Um, wife of the Prince of Orange at the time. And basically the poor Dutch found themselves between the rock and the hard place, or the devil and the deep blue sea maybe, because on one side they had the Prussian army, 
mobilizing and going, you manhandled my sister. Basically, if you're the king of Prussia and your sister gets manhandled, you'd better... The person who did the manhandling had better not be anywhere near your army. And on the other side, you have the British going, you sound suspiciously pro-French. We don't like the Dutch being pro-French. Here, our fleet's coming to say hello as well. For some reason... Um, there was a very rapid counter coup, and <laughs> the House of Orange was restored <laughs> dramatically quickly. Um, I'm not sure why, because I, I, I'm fairly, I, I'm sure the Dutch felt that they had a chance in that case. But that, you know, that's just four years after he became prime minister, and he's doing a few quite cool things. He's quite a good prime minister, honestly. Um, I won't get into the whole was he gay or not debate, or what was he. I have a feeling that the man spent his entire life about politics. I'm not sure if you noticed any uh, anything existed other outside of politics. He certainly seems to have had relationships with both, close friendships with both young ladies and young men. But The most interesting reaction here, though, is he does this trick successfully against the Dutch, against the Spanish, and then he tries it against Catherine the Great. Now, there's one thing, okay? When you try it against the Dutch, they have an empire, but also they had the Prussian army looking at them as well. So you had a mobilization on both sides. Before anyone starts to think it's what's a mobilization, uh, basically, when you're not using your ships at a line, your big ships in your navy, barring a few, which are maintained as guard ships and various other duties, um, station flagships and some small squadrons, the vast majority are laid up. They are store, or they are sort of, some of them are even pulled up and they are being maintained and all sorts of things. There's all sorts of things done with them to take care of them. But that means they're not really readily available. It takes time to get them ready. They're not on call or on duty permanently. And that explains another reason why ships and wooden ships lasted so long. Uh, they would all spend a lot of their careers sometimes out of the water or in dry dock, or various spaces being looked after, and not used, and not pelted into the sea. Against the Spanish, well, France was in disarray, and Spain had the choice of taking on Britain again, which had a... In the nicest way, it it starts in 1789, but really the mobilization doesn't really get going till 1790 because it's so late in the year. Um, and you almost wonder if Pitt's demand are trying to get a war because he basically starts out by demanding you will have to concede trade, British trading rights in all of Spanish territories around the world entirely. And that's pretty much a declaration of war act. I mean, really, that is, that is, I don't know, like, to in the modern day, I don't know, Trump walking into China and saying, you have to allow my our construction companies um to be able to compete undercut and build all the infrastructure in china china would be going mm, no and american companies would be going well hey the thing was this is the disturbing thing he actually manages to do this they concede because france is in disarray and then, of course, he tries on Russia over the Okhikov, Fortress of Okhikov. For starters, 
he can't pick it out on the map. Secondly, I can barely pronounce it. <sighs> Pretty much he's doing it because of the experience of the armed neutrality and the problems that had caused Britain. But more importantly, he's doing it because he's managed to get quite powerful. But the thing is, he's forgotten one small problem with Russia. Russia is a humongous land empire with, whilst a lot of coastline, no real exposure to the sea because it's so freaking cold. And you would need a huge army to try and do anything to Russia. Which Napoleon is going to, of course, try, uh, tries, but... um. Let's be honest. That was probably not Napoleon's greatest idea. Maybe, you know, what is it with dictators? They start off by threatening to invade Britain and then they go and invade Russia. Napoleon. Hitler. I'm sure there's another one who does the same thing. Who does, he try, threatens to come this way and then marches that way. What is it, people going, we can't crack Britain, let's go invade Russia. One's an island with, uh, let's be honest, a lot of very sarcastic people on it. Taking us over is never going to be fun. And the other is an ice fortress for several months of the year. Honestly. Go conquer somewhere warm. Right. Speaking of somewhere warm, try South America. Now, the interesting thing is this is Battle of the River Plate, and I'm actually going to do the Battle of the River Plate a couple of times in these presentations because the Battle of the River Plate turns up in quite a lot of stuff usually. This is about the being present thing. And all these quotes are about the Foreign Office. But the thing was, the Royal Navy South American Division regularly visited ports. They regularly backed up ambassadors. So, you know, in a nicest way, even Uruguay. Montevideo, which is not, let's be honest, the largest country in South America, or the most important by a long way at this point, gets regular visits. It gets a world-class ambassador sent to it, Millington Drake, who pretty much but as far as the Germans are concerned, has managed to single-handedly make the entire Uruguayan population fall in love with him. Uh, you know, Chinese wolf diplomats take note of this. Rather than making pronouncements about dictating Ch uh, things to, you know, Uruguay, um, he was doing world-class things, helping them get into the Olympics, t uh, getting the Olympic squad together, yeah, helping them with their national football team. He was more popular at several points than their own politicians. Uh, there are a few politicians whom you used in Uruguay that, frankly, the quickest way to lose your election you know, would be to say something rude about Millington Drake, who was so beloved. But not only does this, he has good relations with the Navy himself. It's the Foreign Office and the Navy working together. If you're American, it'll be the State Department and the Navy working together. Two working hand in hand tends to be a very good foreign policy system. And this means that when the Navy makes a request, he understands what the Navy is asking for. And he's very familiar with the laws about naval usage and naval visitations. And he uses all that stuff. And <laughs> one of the great joys is. The whole purpose, the aim of the battle, is to destroy the grass bay and stop it as a threat. The battle is a mission kill of it. It gets into Uruguay, but let's be honest, Monteverde, it's going to... It's still technically able to move, although with so much damage, frankly, um, 
No, I'm not sure it's viability on a long cruise or definitely not trying to get home. It suffered a lot of damage. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, that's in part two, I think. What then happens is they get killed off with diplomacy. Melanton Drake is the one who sinks the Grass Bay. The Navy damaged and put it in his harbour. But once it's in his harbour, the uh, battleship of Britain, known as HMS Millington Drake of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, soon puts pay to any ideas the Grass Bay has of getting out of his clutches. It works. It wasn't just, though, this time that Britain had good connections with South America. And it's something which you notice to this day. Now, there is an entire book about this particular event. Phoenix Squadron by Roland White. That is HMS Ark Royal in 1976, four years later. So it's the closest I could find a decent picture to 1972. Previously, what they'd done to deter conflict had been a frigate had shown up, but no. This time, Guatemala was really going for it, and Guatemala wanted... <sighs> okay, this is going to sound terrible, because whilst I don't agree with it, I can see Guatemala's logic. Belize is sort of a bit cut out of them. British Honduras is a bit cut out of them. You know, uh, taking that is very nice. It, it gives them a, you know, nice side-to-side -side country. Looks far easier from the map makers. And maybe once you've got Belize, you can start working on, you know, some of the other countries around you. Maybe Honduras itself. Or El Salvador. Or, you know, all sorts of little things that could be very, very... Tasty morsels. And that's the whole point with conquering. Once you start, you don't can't stop. Basically, conquering is the same as um, I'm trying to remember what the crisps are called. Please comment with what the crisps are called. What is it? Once you pop, you can't stop. Oh. Can't remember. Anyway, it's a very cool book. So, previously they had stopped them by basically deploying a frigate. This time, when they're really, really warming up, Ark Royal races down from the coast of North America and launches Buccaneers at the extreme range to do a nice overflight, and then more Buccaneers turn up next day. She's keep getting closer, and basically this is pointing out to the um, to the Guatemalans that, uh, yes, you might well have an advantage in ground troops, but we will bomb the living bolt out of you. And um, eventually, some of our own ground troops will show up to protect British Honduras. Next time they do it, actually, what happens is they have to send a flyer squadron of RAF Harriers over there. And that's a complicated process. Because that happens after, um, I think, the Carrot Arc Royal's gone. And it's actually used as one of the reasons why the Royal Navy gets its through deck cruisers. <sighs> You know, these things work, but what are all these incidents like? Why am I talking about all these incidents? Well, I'll explain that more after the next one. Let's go to... And I think this actually is the last one. I'm not sure. Done. Yes! We've got the... What are the upcoming for July themes, um, the various topics being chosen. As you'll see, some are on Mondays. Those are on the Mondays when I've got some work on the Tuesdays. So basically, I've played them around. I try to keep it the Tuesdays and Thursdays because I like Tuesdays and Thursdays. Because honestly, I like having Mondays fairly free. Assuming I like my Mondays 
I like an extended. I I like a bit of, you know. I work on. I I do the brew ships on a Sunday, so I like to have the Monday free. But I'm gonna keep the brew ships going. So some Mondays I'm gonna have to do some work as well. It's terrible. And actually, that's gonna be both the patrons ones on Monday. And the patrons are. Well, these are the vote options, and they will be open till Saturday. Uh, till I think it's um lunchtime Sunday, so the fourteenth. Yeah, today's Thursday, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, fourteenth lunchtime, fourteenth. And these are the five options for the patrons to vote for. And as you can see. There are some very, very interesting topics here. In fact, they're all interesting topics. So the top two, the one, two of those which get the most votes, are going to be the topics. And basically, number two is going to be done on the first Monday of the month. And number one is going to be done on the third Monday of the month. Be fun for July. Now, one of the things I don't want you to get the idea from here is that naval diplomacy is all about force. The trouble is, it's most obvious when it's being used as such. All these ones are about mobilizations. All these ones are about force being demonstrated or force being present. But that isn't what naval diplomacy is about, because all those things, when it happens, are building upon years and years of presence, are building upon years and years of consistency. The mobilizations that Pitt conducted are all based upon the fact that the Royal Navy has mobilized before and has built up a reputation as a war fighting force in the seven years wars and other wars which have gone on so you are this is what you're dealing with you are dealing with a force which is well known for its capabilities so it's being mobilized when you're dealing with singtao as i've said you've had years and years of those cruisers visiting years and years of the royal navy being familiar with the japanese navy understanding them knowing how far they can push them what they can do them because they have the presence. Knowing Singtao Harbour well enough, even though it's not a harbour they have actually run or controlled, that have been German, taken over by the Japanese during World War One, all these things, they still knew it well enough that even without pilots, even without help, they could steam in at pretty much full pelt. And they could position themselves in the harbour, knowing exactly how they could get around that harbour. And it wasn't just Birmingham, which Birmingham was pretty new on station. It had been going on enough that there were generations of officers who, even if they had gone previously on another ship or if they had experience, you know, on other things, were there, were able, were part of the crews. That level of institutional knowledge had been built up across generations and a bro a, a, not just in generations, but across the generations in terms of there was a broad range of experience in every generation going up, which meant they could do these things. The thing you always remember also is that at Singtao, a midshipman, Ashworth, who goes on to become Admiral of the Fleet many, many years later, is put with a chief petty officer, a couple of leading seamen, and a few, a few, well, a couple of killicks, as they're called, as they're more than you really call them, and a few sailors aboard the SS Vincent de Paul. A midshipman is sent because, honestly, it's too small a command for, an offer, for a more senior officer, but also that's just about the right rank. It's all about picking a rank which is correct for the number you're sending, but also not going to be provocative. Junior lieutenant isn't available because they're being used for other things, so a senior midshipman does perfectly. But still, you think about that poor, that young boy. 
and he knows if he makes the wrong mistake when he's got custom losses and Japanese personnel trying to board the ship and he's resisting them without firing, just standing on top of the stairs, blocking them. One wrong move, one failure of communication, one drawn gun, and there's war between major powers. They don't draw their guns because they know what he represents. He doesn't draw his gun because he has confidence in what he represents. And that's naval diplomacy, that's conflict management. Deterrence is about presence. Presence is about both having the ships there and having the ships at home, which you can send. Which is why it's important, why I talk about things like having, uh, needing multiples of ships, not just two Queen Elizabeth class carriers, but if you're going to replace Avon Bulwark with ski ramp assisted LHDs, you know, like the Canberra class, you would need three. Because if you had five vessels as your sort of core, of with five flight decks of aviation, you would always be able to count on two. It's a consistency of capability which you can build a forward presence on. And that forward presence allows you to deter and manage conflict. I'll be explaining this more as we go on, but you know, that's why I'm making the points I do. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'm now going to go and try and record part two. See ya. Chatting.